Hello, everyone. My name is Natalie Turvey. I'm president and executive director of the Canadian Journalism Foundation. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this JTalks live event, Reimagining Opinion Journalism, featuring Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and New York Times opinion editor Kathleen Kingsbury. Thank you for joining us for this important conversation exploring the future of journalism. We're grateful for the generosity of our exclusive JTalks series sponsor, TD Bank Group for making today's conversation possible. And our thanks also to our in-kind supporters, CPAC and Cision. If you would like to support the work of the CJF, you can donate now or at any time on the CJF website. And if you'd like to tweet about today's conversation, and we hope you do, our hashtag is JTalksLive. Our program is 45 minutes long and you can still submit questions for our guest at any time via the tab on your screen. The first op-ed page appeared in the New York Times on September 21st, 1970. In April of this year, the Times announced that after five decades, its opinion section will no longer use the term op-ed. 50 years ago, few could have imagined today's digital journalism era, a climate of fast-moving news cycles and polarization, a wash in opinions. Last week, we spoke to three award-winning Canadian columnists who work to provide commentary and context within this landscape. And today we are thrilled to speak with one of the world's most influential editors for ideas and opinion journalism. Kathleen Kingsbury joins us to share her insights on how opinion journalism should evolve in the digital age to better support inclusive and representative discourse. Kathleen is in New York and it's such a privilege to have her on our virtual stage today. Leading this conversation, please welcome our host and one of Canada's best known journalists, Anna Maria Tremonti. Well, thank you, Natalie and uh, Kathleen, Katie Kingsbury, welcome. Thank Hi, you for thank joining you so us. Much for having me. I'm it's it's my pleasure. Uh, let's just talk history for a moment then. 1970, that was the first well, called, then called op-ed um, piece in North America or anywhere. I, my understanding is anywhere. Um, so uh, it's really the modern op-ed page. You know, there were always obviously opinion columnists and editorials. The Times began writing editorials, we believe, in the late 1800s. The first endorsement, political endorsement, the Times ever did was in 1860. We we endorsed uh, Abraham Lincoln, which I think we still feel pretty proud of. Um, and yeah, the um, the page was conceived of by one of my predecessors as an opportunity to bring in uh, pieces that were perhaps more extreme in terms of the politics and culture questions of the day than the editorials. Um, people often think that op-ed meant opposite the editorial stance of the Times, and that certainly ended up being the case because of the mission that uh, the editors then set out uh, to undertake. But actually, it really meant the page opposite the editorial page um, in print. You know, that is a print convention that doesn't mean that much to most people anymore. And so um, when we were talking in April about some redesigns that we were making, it occurred to us that we could be clearer in the description of these essays that we, um, that we both um, commission, but also accept from outside voices from the Times, and, and we landed on guest essays, um, which was intuitive. We, we did many, many focus groups, um, and it was very intuitive to readers what the relationship of the writer was when they saw that term guest essay. Okay, well, and let's talk about some of the nut, nuts and bolts, because when we think of New York Times opinions, in 2021, with all the technology, what does the opinion section that you oversee, that you run, actually encompass? And how many people are we talking about? Sure. We have about 150 people spread across the globe. At last count, I believe um, spread, they live in 18 different cities. 
Um, we have, of course, writers and editors, columnists, editorial writers, um, and people who take care of our letters to the editor page, uh, which is also under opinion. We also have a video team and an audio team and a, um, an audience team, uh, audiences, our audience engagement team. We have designers, we have uh, visual journalists who create graphics. We have um, a, a, a whole new suite of newsletter writers and editors that we've hired in the last six months. So yeah, it's a, it's a much bigger than those two print pages that I was describing at the beginning. Um, today, a lot of that growth has happened in the last, since I arrived at the Times in 2017. And um, you know, it's just an excellent group of journalists. And you also have a number of podcasts that are under opinion, is that correct? Yes, yes, yes. That's our audio team. So we have um, three podcasts that we have launched since the spring of 2020. And then we have a podcast that's in development that we recently hired um, Lulu Garcia Navarro from NPR to, to host. And um, in an age of um, uh, journalism where there is a lot of opinion and activism, how do you define? opinion for the opinion section? Uh, That's a great question. You know, what we are trying to, you know, strive for every day with our pieces are clear, cogent argument, logical thought. We like to explore ideas in the way that um, is distinctive from our news colleagues. Um, we, we are very separate at the times. Um, opinion is, you um, walled off from the newsroom in a lot of important ways. Um, and, you know, that is in order to maintain the Times independence. We are often, however, very newsy and trying to give people a lot of context and clarity around the news. Mm. So I want to jump right into the, the, um, the Tom Cotton op-ed because a lot changed. Mm -hmm. um, including your job. Um, so, and, and yeah, I, I'm going to take a, a leap of faith and say that the majority of people watching this right now know the Tom Cotton op-ed, but- um, You can Google it. You'll find out all about it. <laughs> um, but maybe I, I'd like to know what was, as the Times looked at that and changed, what was wrong with it and sure. what has changed? Sure. Um, so, I should say that my in my past role, I became, um, I was the deputy editorial page editor. In my responsibilities were our editorial board, our letters to the editor, um, as well as our audience teams. I was not directly involved in the, the publication of the Cotton Op-Ed. I, I read it for the first time when it was on our website, the same as um, as all of our, all of you. Um, the real problem was a process breakdown. We after in, you know, there were a series of judgment calls that were perhaps, that were flawed. I can just say they were flawed. Um, you know, the idea of publishing that op-ed uh, on, as Asia was dawning on June 4th, which of course is the anniversary of Tiananmen Square, um, was a bad decision. We had um, leapfrogged some of our processes around headline writing. Um, what was really wrong with that piece, you could imagine Tom Cotton doing an essay that made a similar case to the one that he did, but it was, um, you know, for example, um, Cotton is military veteran. He could have talked about how military training is better than police training in terms of, for instance, violence de-escalation. But that wasn't what that piece was. You know, the flaws there were around tone. They were around um, decisions about when it was published. There were some fact-checking issues. And so when it happened, um, we undertook a really extensive review of what we thought had gone wrong um, and how we could fix it. I should pause here to say, you know, James Bennett, who was my predecessor, brought me to the Times. He is one of the most brilliant journalists I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, he, I will always be grateful for the role he's played in and the things he taught me as an editor. Um, but, you know, we, we really fundamentally needed to make some changes. The first thing that we did was we looked at volume. Um, at the time, you'll probably remember, we were in, of course, the midst of the George Floyd protests. 
We simultaneously were covering the pandemic. Um, we were leading up to the 2020 election, and we were producing an enormous amount of journalism every day as a department, much more than we should have. And so we, one of the first things that we did was cut our volume by about 30%. We immediately saw paid, media and page views shoot up, which um, was um, affirming that that had been the right decision. We also looked back, as I mentioned, so Times Opinion has grown significantly since I arrived in 2017. Uh, you know, as I said, we added an audio team, we added a, uh, a video team, we added a uh, graphics team. We had grown our editorial board, we had grown our op-ed editing ranks, we had overhauled our design operation. We had done a lot of really, really exciting work, but we needed to look back at the infrastructure that we needed to support that work. And so another thing we did was add to what was already a large fact-checking team um, and copy editing team to make sure that we felt we had enough uh, guardrails in place. Um, we had, of course, already processes in place that could and should have prevented um, the the cotton op-ed to be published, um, the version of it that was published that was, but um, some of those those steps just needed to be reinforced. Uh, some of the strongest and um, most um, public criticism of that op-ed came um, from in, internally from sure. your your colleagues, and a lot of it from outside of the opinion section. Sure. I'm wondering how that has changed anything for the New York Times in terms of, um, of how you include staff or how you navigate that issue of, of staff disagreeing on, on very fundamental levels. It wasn't, it wasn't frivolous disagreement, obviously. So how, how did it change internally then? How did it change internally? This is a great question. You know, I think that one of the things we also learned um, through the cotton op-ed was that we needed to do a better job of communicating both internally and externally, frankly, um, about why we were making the editorial decisions that we were, um, you know, why we saw certain pieces having worth, why we are starting to, um, you know, um, why we are choosing to explore certain ideas. And I actually would say very little changed you know, we still publish every single day pieces that uh, our editors and our readers agree and disagree with. We still strive to interrogate ideas and help people grapple with the world. Um, we uh, publish in a huge range of writers um, across several different kinds of diversity. We were all doing, we were doing that work before Tom Cotton and we continue to do that work. I think the difference was we felt we needed to communicate more with both our colleagues and our readers about um, you know, why we we're choosing to publish certain ideas. And we've done that through a few different ways. I mean, one of which is a daily newsletter that we do called Opinion Today. Please subscribe. Um, it is an opportunity for both our writers and our editors to talk a little bit about behind the scenes, about various pieces that we are publishing. Um, we also, um, you know, communicate um, in Slack and over email and other ways when we um, are going to publish something that um, we want, you know, we want to alert people to. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's been more about communicating what opinion does, what we see as our mission, why we want to be this convening place for ideas journalism. And, uh, tell, talk to me a little bit more about your mission then, because you, you do carry the weight of the New York Times. It's, it's not course. just any opinion section, right? So what, what is that mission? I think it's everything I just said. We want to be a place that elevates honest debate. We want to interrogate ideas. We want those ideas to challenge our readers. We want readers to find ideas that they agree with, ideas that they disagree with, and feel as though we are um, we have given them both clarity and context around those ideas. Um, we want to help people grapple with what is right now an absolutely changing world. And... Um 
so let's talk a little bit more about that that evolution then, um, because um, again, you're on many platforms and uh, there's so much ability for everyone to weigh in on other platforms. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just like, how do you navigate that and still allow for provocative ideas to come through that some people could find offensive, but that maybe need to be thrown out there, even to be shot down as offensive, but they need to be out there. Of course. I mean, for one, we, we do have um, guardrails, um, guidelines that we always keep in mind. The first of which is we don't publish anything that's inaccurate. We also don't publish anything that we consider to be hate speech um, or hateful. We don't publish anything that has a conflict of interest. And we have a, you know, um, what the job of my editors on a day-to-day -day basis is to decide what we publish. They are all um, an incredible group of journalists who have enormous expertise amongst them. When we're hiring them, we're looking for people who are diving deep into issues, who want to be um, as much of editors as reporters. They're constantly building up their sources, um, although they often come with very, very rich um, lists of sources and experts who they have relied on in their, their careers. When we're hiring, we look for gaps in that expertise. And we are often, um, right now we're, for instance, hiring a climate editor, um, which is something that we have not had anyone dedicated to doing, but we think is really important to have going forward um, because obviously climate is a large issue. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's it. You know, I think that one of the things that, opinion is able to do in a way that our news colleagues can't is for one, we can take a step back when news is happening and make sure that we have the right voice and expertise on um, a, a, a news event. Um, we don't have to cover every news event. We can say, actually, no, we don't have that right idea um, to uh, to publish, and we we can use our own discretion in that way. And I I can't say it enough. I I rely on what is probably the strongest group of editors who work for me, um, the strongest group of editors in opinion journalism that in the world. Tell me a little bit about yourself. What was your first job in journalism? My first job in journalism. So um, I graduated from college in 2001. Um, I got a job in journalism. I had actually, I'd interned at the Associated Press um, as a student, but I um, was a, you know, I graduated without a lot of, um, I hadn't made very many decisions about what I wanted to do. Um, my parents basically said, you have to get a job. Um, I ended up being hired as a junior reporter at a free Boston Daily. I started on uh, August 21st, 2001. Um, I, three weeks later, found myself covering 9-11. I was at the ticket counter at Logan Airport when the crew there learned that Flight 11 um, had American Airlines Flight 11 had been one of the planes that hit the Twin Towers. I broke that news. Um, and, you know, the next three weeks was, I had taken a course at George, I went to Georgetown, I had taken a course called um, History of Modern Islam. And so uh, that was one of the last classes I took at Georgetown. And I became an expert for both my colleagues and other journalists in the differentiation between, for instance, Shiite and Sunni Muslims. Um, and it was, you know, one of the most fulfilling reporting experiences that I've had in my career, but simultaneously, absolutely one of the most overwhelming. Mm, what a time to start journalism. Yeah. Um, and you ended up working internationally a lot, did you not? Yeah, I went to both Shanghai and Hong Kong, um, where I was a foreign correspondent. I covered, I was Times Asia correspondent, um, so Time Magazine's Asia correspondent. So I covered pretty much from India to Japan and Korea to uh, really down to New Zealand. 
um, for a period, um, which was also one of my favorite jobs that I've had. Um, I always tell the story. There was one December I was on an airplane in the United States visiting for Christmas and the young man next to me was super nervous and he's, he was shaking and he's like, I'm so sorry. This is the first time I've ever flown before. Have you been on an airplane before? And I was like, I've been on 17 airplanes this month. Um, and, um, you know, we had ended up heading off and having a great conversation, but, um, that was definitely the lifestyle. I, I, the place I spent the most time in that period was at the Hong Kong Starbucks. Um, it, it, it was home for me, the Hong Kong airport Starbucks. So, mm -hmm. And, you know, over the course of, of your career then in the field and across the globe, um, and now in the job that you have now where you're running this many tentacled section, what strikes you about where we are today with journalism when it comes to opinion and activism and the ongoing quest for truth and accountability? And just talk to me a little bit about how you see that evolution Oh, it's, that's a, a really interesting question. Um, I think there are a few things. I mean, for one, um, as I mentioned, I graduated from college in 2001. If you look at any chart of print advertising, that was actually the year it fell off a cliff. Um, so I never really had the opportunity to work in a journalism ecosystem that didn't include digital. Um, and yet I also came up through several legacy institutions like Time Magazine, the Boston Globe, and now the Times where I was, um, you know, able to experience the ability to have fact checkers and copy editors and um, a variety of things that some digital newsrooms don't have. Um, and so I think for one with journalism today is you always have to take in the economics part of it. Um, and I think opinion journalism in particular can be very engaging. I think that columnists, for instance, create habit um, and allow people to create a connection with the paper um, in a way that we, you know, for sure see with the Times columnist ranks. Um, I was with Tom Friedman a few weeks ago and you know people were coming up to him and knew him and offering their opinion about his work and you can just tell that they had a even if they had never met him before they had a loyal relationship with him um i think that at the same time as you describe we are in a moment where people are really looking for stability and clarity and they want to be able to understand what is happening in their communities. And I think opinion journalism, and of course newsrooms do that, um, but I think opinion journalism can also tap into helping people know how to feel about um, various events in a way that um, doesn't always come through a news story. So I think about opinion journalism at its best moving people, whether that's changing their mind, whether that's reinforcing a view that they already have, whether that's just making them laugh or making them cry or making them feel some emotion. Um, you know, I, I really think that that is something as the United States as a country right now need. Um, I think that we are seeing that on the global level, of course, through the pandemic and other um, political movements that we've seen in recent years. Um, and I think that, you know, it is an enormous privilege that we get to help people through live their lives in a way that um, can hopefully um, bring them meaning. And you have, um... Uh, a number of very established, well-known opinion journalists on your roster. How do you um, how do you make sure that you um, you you are inclusive? Um, you know, gender diversity, racial diversity in in your roster of actual those those columnists who are back every week or sure. more often versus the guest essay. Like, what are you looking for? Where where are and are you looking for submissions or do you reach out to them? How does all that work? Sure, of course. So we, in terms of diversity, we were always trying to broaden the diversity that we have in our report. Um, we uh, look at that from through a racial lens, a gender lens, a topic lens, for instance, um, you know, 
uh, politics and foreign policy will always be our bread and butter, but often we see pieces that are the most read being coming from um, conversations that people are having on business or culture, um, technology, especially. Um, we are um, also looking at it through an ideological lens. Um, we that's and we really think about when I'm we're trying to think about um, hiring a columnist, for instance. We we take all of that into consideration. Of course, it's always nice to have great writers be part of your ranks. Um, we have um, we have both our columnists who are our signature New York Times voices. We have a great group of newsletter writers that we recently have brought to the Times, John McWhorter, Jay Caspian Kang. John McWhorter is a Columbia linguist. Jay Caspian Kang is um, a longtime writer for the New York Times Magazine, who's a culture critic. We have Kara Swisher, who writes on technology. Um, we recently announced that Tom Morello, who is the lead guitarist of Rage Against the Machine, is doing um, a limited run newsletter with us. Um, we have um, Tish Harrison Warren, who is a social conservative Anglican um, priest uh, who writes a, a weekly newsletter. Uh, Trustee Cotton McMillan, or McMillan Cotton, excuse me, uh, who is a sociologist who writes just um, a fantastic newsletter. All of these, please subscribe to. Um, <laughs> I have to plug. But yeah, we, we really think about um, a range of different factors when it comes to having um, a group of diverse writers. Um, you know, we have a, a really excellent international report um, from opinion that leans on finding people in country around the world to talk about their own personal experience. Um, and um, when it comes to guest essays, we, you, as you asked, we, we do actually mostly commission guest essays. So we don't... Um, we get thousands of submissions a week um, through our submission process, but we um, try very hard to, as, as you know, my staff, um, think about the kinds of arguments we want to read, um, what we've done too much of, what we haven't done enough of. We try to look around the corner. We think of it as um, both responding to news events as they happen, but also because of the size of our platform, we're constantly asking ourselves what kind of conversations we want to start. Mm, okay. And I noticed uh, Tom Morello's um, uh, pieces include audio. Uh, like, so you're, yeah, you're changing yeah. it up there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's all... All credit there is due to our incredible digital designers um, and our audio colleagues who made that happen. It was not an easy process. Uh, we have done some experiments with putting audio into pieces before. Um, our graphics director, Stuart Thompson, did an incredible piece back in January where we embedded audio clips of QAnon followers talking um, in through a chat um, service about um, their beliefs and, and to hear that added just like a level of humanity to this conversation that we've been having about the far right, um, unlike anything that I had experienced before. But um, yeah, so, but doing it in newsletter form, doing it, um, you know, um, week after week with Tom's newsletter, um, it, it was something new for us. And um, I was just blown away by the, the solutions that they came up with. Um, I'm going to go to some audience questions now too, because they're starting to overlap what I want to ask. And so okay. I'm going to cut right to the chase here. Um, I've got a, a question from Abby S who asks, how does the New York Times protect opinion journalists, especially women of color? Oh, that's interesting. Is the question, I assume, protect them from abuse online, do you think? I'm, I'm guessing uh, be, for, yeah. like, protect or, them once they put out opinions where they can be um, harassed online is what I'm guessing. Okay, okay, sure. Okay, I wanted to make sure I knew that I understood the question. So we take security very, very seriously at the Times. We've made a lot of investments in the last few years um, in terms of building up those resources. Um, if we have a, someone who writes for us who finds themselves um, under attack, we most often hear from that person first. Um, but in the cases that we don't, we're constantly monitoring social media um, 
not me, but our security team, thankfully, who are much better at it than I am. Um, and they flag things. We make sure that people get, um, there's outreach. We make sure that they get the, um, the backing of the institution in terms of helping them protect their identity and lock down their accounts and all those things. Um, and so, yeah, we, we take it very seriously and we're lucky enough to have a lot of resources that we can use to help people. Mm. Got a question from Donald Joswishan who says, um, like in the scientific community where we have developed standards for what is considered robust and trusted evidence, is there any appetite for the global journalism community to collaborate on developing standards and guidelines for what can be informed and trusted opinion? Oh, wow. What an interesting idea. Um, I think that journalists, by their nature, we, you know, we have... We have a code, um, you know, um, we, we talk about factual accuracy and conflicts of interest and um, a whole variety of, of other things that we, we hold ourselves to. I don't know, I've never heard that idea before. I like, I like it. I'm, my first impression is that it might be helpful, um, but I, I think that I'd have to give it a little bit more thought. I'm guessing there would be organizations that would just refuse that would like to stay rogue yeah. and not, not agree with them. Um, I'm sure that's other. true. I'm sure that's no. true. I also don't know how you enforce it. Right. Um, no. And so, you know, the times itself has uh, an incredible legal department. We have an incredible standards um, uh, group that um, the times has laid out in its ethical handbook. Um, the things that we hold ourselves and our journalists to Um in terms of ethics. And so um, I don't, I'm not even sure we need necessary a global, global guidance, but I, it, it's a really interesting idea. Um, a question from Margot Van Sleitman who asks um, to, if you could speak to how you balance the personal, the professional and the political, which are each entwined and how we receive and perceive news and information. Huh. That's an interesting question, Margot. Um, I think that it is, it, it's something we have to work at every single day, actually. Um, you know, and I think sometimes we get it right and sometimes we, we don't. Um, and it's just trying to make sure that we are confident that we have a report that's full of a range of voices and experiences um, that we're really constantly gut checking and making sure that we feel we are covering the most important conversations um, and ideas. And, and ultimately, I, again, I'll go back and say, I, I rely on the expertise of um, my editors who are veterans at this and who are also very, very, you know, um, willing to keep learning. So there's a lot of internal discussion. Like you are, it yes. sounds like you're constantly, um, yes. just constantly talking about what are we missing? What do we need to do here? Did we do yeah. this right? What do we need to make this better? It's just, yes. you must be in a lot of meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I am in a lot of meetings. I am in a lot of meetings. I mean, I really see my job uh, ultimately um, as helping great journalists do great journalism. Um, and so I, of course, want to be a thought partner to people. I'm, um, I am in a lot of discussions on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we are um, also, you know, slaves to slack the way that most newsrooms are. Um, but yeah, and then, you know, that doesn't even include the fact that we are um, frequently meeting with, having lunch with, um, trying to keep track of uh, um, a whole range of external experts that either write for us or who we write about. Um, one, of my, one part of my job is, um, running the editorial board, um, that's about um, 
12 writers who all are experts on different topics. Um, one of my favorite parts of the week is having editorial board meetings. We, you know, throw out a subject that we think that the Times institutional voice should weigh in on, and then we just hash it out. Um, we, we have really, really active debates and being there with a group of really talented journalists who have bring to the table an enormous um, amount of journalism experience, um, learning from them, having a respectful conversation around important ideas. It's like nothing's better in the world. It's, it's interesting too, because you talk about opinion and journalism and how they really are entwined. And at the same yeah. time, we want um, another kind of journalism and it exists in, in, in your institution, in your paper. Um, uh, where you don't want opinion, you just want you want people to know what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. So a question from Hannah Alper, how do you separate activism and journalism when they're so closely entwined? Hmm. That's an interesting question, Hannah. Um, so I think that you're getting at something, Anna Maria, which is that every piece that we run is really rich with reporting. And that's really, you know, we have facts and fact gathering at the basis of, of every piece that we run. Um, we are constantly trying to find pieces and um, writers who we think can surprise our readers um, and who will um, be able to introduce a, a new idea, a new concept, a, a new piece of information to them. Um, and I think that... Um, when it comes to activism, which is a different thing, it's it's activism very, very rarely leaves room for being searching and for being willing to acknowledge that there's another side of the conversation. And yet our pieces, the very best pieces, but really every piece that we run, um, we ask writers to grapple with what are the critiques and criticisms that are going to be lodged at you and how can we incorporate, um, anticipate in your work for us, those critiques. And um, sometimes that's easier said than done. Uh, but at the end of the day, I do think that that's the difference between opinion journalism and ideas journalism versus activism. Um, it's that reporting and it's also a willingness to, it's a willingness to know that you might be wrong. Mm, okay. That's really important. It, like you're really making the point as well as you can have an opinion and you can express it, but mm. at, in the course of expressing it, um, you have to be factual Yes. and, and you, um, you have to consider those who might disagree with you. Yes. In a respectful way. Yeah. Yes. No. Interesting. Um, and um, so, so there's a question that, that feeds right into that from uh, Michael Greeson, who asks, in an age of deep division and misinformation, few people, he says, turn from Fox News to read the NYT for an alternative, alternative point of view. Um, and I don't know if that's true, but um, that is probably what a lot of us assume anyway. How does misinformation ever get countered? What steps can be taken to heal the divide? Hmm. I mean, we, we ask ourselves that all the time, I think. Um, you know, I, it's we try to build empathy through a lot of our work. And I think that is what is going to um, ultimately heal that divide is um, people being able to find connection with each other. I, would, I, I actually think that the idea that someone would go from Fox News to the New York Times um, is actually probably not fully correct. <laughs> um, I think our audience is, is quite large and I think that we are, um, we are quick to make those assumptions, but um, that, that they don't actually all always bear out. Um, I do think though that um, the, the question, it really comes down to trust, right? And figuring out how to build trust. So take for instance, the decision to um, do away with the term op-ed. Op-ed is jargon uh, to most people in the modern era. It doesn't mean anything because they haven't encountered our print paper. And so I think whenever we can do to demystify journalism, that to, to create that trust. So just a small example, when I got to the Times, um, 
I had a writer who came to me and asked me if they could quote someone in an editorial. It had, it wasn't done. And honestly, we have to show our work. We have to explain to people where we get our information from and our knowledge and how we make decisions um, in a way that makes them trust us and allows them to trust us. Um, and that's why it's so important that the Times remain an independent um, so news source um, in a way that Fox News has decided that they don't want to be. Um, you've touched on this, but it's worth uh, maybe um, underlining a little bit. Stel uh, Susan Stellan has a question here. How can opinion sections increase contributions from people who have personal experiences with things such as incarceration, poverty, homelessness, to augment guest essays by academics and advocates whose research or work, um, who research or work on these topics? I would argue we actually do that really very regularly. Um, we uh, we do try to find voices that are writing from their own personal experience quite frequently. I, what immediately comes to mind is a piece that we ran by a 17-year-old um, high school student who was writing about um, crafting college essays and how he was repeatedly asked to write about his childhood and poverty and how he he didn't want that to be what defined him. Um, it's a piece that um, of all the pieces that we've done over the past year um, has really stuck with me. Um, we also do this um, through using different forms. So um, that I think is an advantage that video and audio uh, allow for our um, our journalists to capture some thoughts. You know, not everyone um, is a professional writer, of course. Um, that can be very intimidating for people to like the idea of having to write a thousand word essay um, can be something that terrifies the average person I can imagine. Um, and so being able to use those other forms to capture their viewpoints, I think can be really powerful. We also do a lot of um, pieces. We did a large package um, about income inequality in two, early 2020. And we did this series of photo essays um, where we talk to people about their own family income and um, you know household expenses basically um, and we did those as as told to's through we had a reporter go and talk to people and um, to obviously transcribe their responses we recently did a, a wonderful essay by jesse wegman about um, the um, voters in Florida who are disenfranchised because of fines and fees that they owe um, their local governments, um, almost entirely because they'd been incarcerated uh, in the past. Um, and again, that was, you know, Jesse being a filter for those people's stories. Um, but they absolutely came through and um, Damon Winter, who is our um, staff photographer based in opinion, did these incredible portraits of them. And I think you really got a sense of who they were and um, what was important to them through that, th through that piece. You know, I, I know the pieces you're talking about and I'm, um, and I didn't even realize that was under opinion and I'm pretty good about ch checking that stuff. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's interesting that like, how do you make sure that your own um, subscribers understand that, you know, which, where the walls are, where the lines are as you do that? Well, we do a lot of labeling and we talk a lot about labeling. Uh, we, part of uh, our announcement in April when we moved to guest essay was um, a redesign. We put opinion at the top of every piece that we do in red um, because we wanted to signal as soon as you open the, the piece that it is an opinion piece. Um, we are also um, are working on right now, we haven't, we haven't rolled it out, but we've been in a lot of conversations around we, how we can use design on social media to signal that something is an opinion piece versus a newsroom piece. We obviously have our own module on our homepage that um, separates opinion from the rest of the New York Times um, journalism on our homepage. Um, but yeah, I mean, I do think that there is some confusion and um, we have to be constantly asking ourselves how we can do a better job to make sure people understand that they're reading an opinion piece. We live in a world where a lot of journalism 
um, is atomized and you're not coming to um, uh, opinion through our homepage. You're coming through search, you're coming for, through social, through newsletter links, et cetera. And so it does put an onus on us to make sure that you, you know that you're reading an opinion piece. Another decision that we made was to create what we call our storyline modules in every piece. So um, that means that when you come into an opinion piece, we very quickly at the, towards the top of a piece, try to explain what other pieces we've done on the topic of the essay that you're reading so that people understand that we have done a range of pieces on, on these topics. Um, we are, we try to be really scrupulous about our author bios. So explaining who the author is, why we've chosen them to write this piece, um, you know, why they are the expert to, to write this piece. Um, and of course, disclose any conflicts of interest that you should know about. And so in, a, in an age of real political polarization um, and multi-platform journalism, where do you see opinion going in the future? Like where, where do you think, even like five years down the road, how will you evolve again, do you think? Ah, it's a great question. What a fun exercise. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, can, you, you don't have to be right. We, we, you know, oh, of, course, of course. The world will change many ways. So, uh, <laughs> Um, so, you know, I do put a lot of pressure on myself on this, as I, you know, as we discussed at the beginning of this, the Times was at the forefront of creating the modern op-ed page. I think that gives us, um, puts a lot of pressure on us at being on the cutting edge of, um, of opinion journalism. I think there are a few things. I think one is we're going to see more and more involvement of readers' views integrated into our journalism um, and what our offering is. We already do this quite often. We'll, our, we have incredible comment moderators. They will sometimes curate um, a range of comments on a particular topic, and then we publish that. Um, there is a huge appetite from our audience to participate in our journalism. And I think we need to find ways to represent that within the report, even more ways to rep represent that into the report. I think we're gonna see more and more audio, the use of audio um, in reports. I think we're, we're gonna definitely see more newsletters. Um, if you haven't seen the, the Atlantic just announced they are doing a really um, impressive lineup of newsletters. People like the intimacy of a newsletter arriving in their inbox. Um, it, it carries many of the same traits as a columnist and that you can create a relationship with the writer um, I think we'll see more experimentation with the forms that newsletters can take. However, I think you're going to see more audio in them, more video in them, those kinds of things right now that we don't really have a lot of um, technical uh, ability to do that. But I think we're going to see that. I think you're going to see more um, CGI um, in videos. Um, you know, I think you're going to see more labeling, too, <laughs> going back to the last um, the last question. Um, but I do think that um, opinion journalism in this moment has a power to it um, in that connection that you can form with a reader um, that is um, not going to go away. And I think people are going to need increasingly guidance on what to think about things, how to feel about things, and um, that the appetite for opinion journalism is just going to increase. Um, but again, that just going back to the last question, um, means we have to do an even better job than we already do in, in separating news and opinion. It's so interesting. I mean, the more information we get, the more guidance we seek and you know how do I really think about this let me see how so and so thinks about this and and even and you talk about the letters sometimes I will go to the letters right away just to go okay what are they what are other people who read this thinking right so it's, yeah absolutely it's, yeah. and I think the other the other thing I would just say about that is that um, the world offers so many choices now. I mean, and, I mean, we've already talked in this conversation about how many journalism outlets there are, but um, you know, people have the whole globe to choose from, really, um, in terms of um, 
where they want to live, where they want to work, um, how they want to work, um, you know, um, so many different questions. Um, and at the same time, the world's problems are getting bigger and bigger. I think about climate alone, um, you know, obviously the pandemic, um, that I think people need more and more support in helping make those decisions um, that they are presented with, because if not, it can be paralyzing. So much to think about, Katie Kingsbury. Thanks for talking to me today. And thanks Thank for you so sharing your thoughts me. with us. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And I'm just going to close and uh, just do the last little bit here. Um, Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, those of you who submitted some great questions. We have a, one more exciting event remaining in our fall JTalk season, and we hope you'll join us for that. November 30th, it'll be a behind the scenes look at major Globe and Mail investigations with Tom Cardozo, Grant Robertson, and Chen Wang. And David Mackay, the deputy managing editor at Canada's National Observer, is going to lead that discussion. That's November 30th. Sign up for that one. It's open for registration. You can find it on the CJF website. To stay updated on CJF events, sign up for the newsletter or follow the Canadian Journalism Foundation on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. It's all there. And a reminder, you can find the videos and the podcasts of past talks on the CJF site. That's it for me for this season. Um, but go in on November 30th and David Mackay will take you through that discussion. Thanks for joining us today. Bye bye.